Let's take a look at a low-cost electronic ballast for fluorescent lighting from AliExpress. This cost £3, inclusive of shipping, uh, and another 60p was added on by the English government for their massively efficient running of the country. That was sarcasm. So this is by far one of the flimsiest and lightest ballasts I've come across. I guess these days there, there's not as much demand for these now because we're moving away from fluorescent lights to LED. Although having said that, in many ways, fluorescent lights lasted longer than many of the LED alternatives. So this one is marked as being for one 40 watt tube. Now I'd like to demonstrate this, but I do not have a 40 watt tube. Uh, and the close I've got, well, is 13 watt. And that would not be very happy being connected to this. It would maybe blow the electrodes at the end. However, the first thing I noticed about this is that it's super lightweight and flimsy. The cover unclips and is excruciatingly thin. Inside we have the circuit board with a plasticized paper insulator at the back. It's very common construction for these things. Let's zoom down this a bit more. And the first things I'm seeing here, the mains coming in them, I see a discrete bridge direct far. I'm seeing two capacitors. Two 250 volt capacitors, so they must be wired. They are wired in the series here. Uh, there's the two transistors that do the push pull thing. Uh, this is probably the uh, capacitor that's looped, it is looped between the heaters at the end of the electrodes just to pass some current through them. Where is the rest of the current limiting though? Is it purely done? by the inductor here. There's, it usually charges and discharges the capacitor, but you know, this will be revealed because I shall reverse engineer it and we'll see what the circuitry's like. I was hoping this might be one of the more complex ones with a DIAC. Oh, that might be a DIAC there. Um, okay, tell you what, I'll take a picture of this, both sides, and we'll reverse engineer it and see what the circuitry looks like. One moment, please. Reverse engineering is complete. Let's explore. I shall zoom in on this just a little bit, just to make it easier to see. That should do it. Things worthy of note on this very standard uh, electronic fluorescent ballast, very basic one. The incoming supply goes to these diodes here. They, the four diodes form a bridge rectifier, full rectifier, full wave rectifier. And you've got two smoothing capacitors. They're rated about 250 volts each at 10 microfarad, but they're in the series. And it's interesting to know a center midpoint tap is taken off these and goes to one end of the tube, which is quite unusual. Uh, here is the main uh, current limiting inductor that uh, limits the current through the tube. And there is the feedback transformer that arranges the switching. It senses the current flowing through the yellow winding, and it's got a red and a blue winding, smaller one. And uh, that drives the base of either of these transistors, giving a push-pull effect. Anything else worth mentioning here? Yes, this component here is indeed a DIAC. It's a classic system used to start these fluorescent ballasts in a controlled manner. Um, I think we should go straight to the schematic for this. Interestingly, I've not got a tube here to test this because it is, uh, for a 40 watt tube, I don't have that, a four foot tube. Uh, it does say power factor 0.92. I'm not overly convinced about that. I think they might have just printed that on just for show, but without being able to test it, I cannot tell. I've color coded some sections of this just to make it easier to follow. So here's the power supply. The AC comes in, goes through those diodes, positive to the, that uh, rail, negative to that rail, but that has a midpoint there tap going over to one end of the tube so it's going to be about in the case of the uk it's going to be about 340 volts uh, on this rail zero volt circuit reference in this rail not actually zero volts and then a midpoint voltage of roughly 170 volts going to the tube the tube has the classic little capacitor 4.7 nanofarad uh, between the two heaters uh, and then it's got the current limiting inductor here that's the big huge choke inductor and then it's got that little transformer, which I've colour-coded orange here. Things worth a note, when you start this up initially, the tube initially has a high voltage. It requires the electrodes to be hot to be emitting electrons and therefore lower the voltage, reduce the cathode drop. So initially, if the tube hasn't struck, then current will flow through the heaters, uh, uh, through this capacitor here, uh, and the heaters will heat up. When the tube strikes, and it happens virtually instantly, 
um, the voltage across the tube will drop to about 100 volts typically, and that will result in current continuing fl to flow through the heater electrodes, but just at a reduced level, and it just maintains them at that hot state for uh, running the tube. It uh, uh, treats the tubes quite well, actually, electronic ballasts. So let's take a look at the startup circuit first. That is based, I've coloured it purple here, that is based on this resistor charging this capacitor up. So initially when you turn it on, it's unlikely that the circuit will just start oscillating itself. So in this case, uh, this resistor charges up this capacitor until it reaches the threshold voltage of this diac, which then triggers at around probably about 32 volts, and it suddenly dumps that small value capacitor into the base of this transistor, turning the transistor on. As soon as it does so, current starts flowing um, through the tube, or the heaters, through the inductors, through the sense coil, uh, down through this transistor to the zero volt rail. But it also pulls the capacitor circuit, the uh, charge capacitor here, if it's not dumped completely through this uh, the diac, it pulls it down via this diode. And this basically means that once the circuit is oscillating um, continually, then because this diode is being pulled down to the zero volt rail continually every time this transistor turns on, it means that after it's started oscillating, then although this resistor is still trickling current to this capacitor, the capacitor can't, can't charge up because it keeps getting discharged via this diode. That is the starting circuit. When it has started and current is uh, flowing, the using conventional current flow, it's going from the midpoint of the capacitors through the tube and it's going to the zero volt rail uh, through this transformer. And in doing so, it induces uh, current in this transformer, which then drives the base of that transistor. These transistors are both NPN. Normally, you'd expect an NPN to be switching to the zero volt rail like this one is. But ultimately, because they're not relying on a emitter reference to zero volts, they've effectively got a closed circuit here with this little coil. So the coil itself, the little transformer winding, is actually powering the transistor directly. So they, they could be treated as almost like isolated sections of circuitry. Um, now, here's the odd thing. Normally, there'd be a capacitor in series of the tube, and when the capacitor had fully charged or discharged, current would cease to flow uh, on that half cycle of the oscillation. And the current through this transformer would drop to zero and then it would slam into reverse, so to speak. Once uh, it had dropped to zero, it would turn this transistor off and it would turn this transistor on. But in this case, because it's got a sender tap, I guess they're possibly doing this for the lower voltage to minimise the amount that gets dropped across the rest of the circuitry here. Um, but because of the way they're doing that, I reckon that the main limiting factor is the saturation of this little transformer, the little um, feedback toroid with the yellow winding and the two windings, the red and the blue. Because when it saturates to the point that it can't couple current across to the other coils, then it will have the same effect. And uh, it will sort of slam into reverse when the magnetic field in this collapses. It will start driving this transistor, which then pushes current through in the opposite direction and uh, then induces current in its uh, own base drive, but also makes sure that this one is shut off. Uh, it's notable there is a little diode here and it's positioned with these resistors such that um, when the voltage in the opposite direction in the coil, it's going to just create a shunted loop here and it's not going to actually try and reverse bias the uh, transistor in any way. These resistors then will actually help limit the current. It's a very efficiently designed circuit. So the net result of that is that uh, it basically alternates this line to the positive and negative rails. Uh, that's more or less it, except for this bit in pink, which someone speculated was for providing a sort of like a, a ref, sort of voltage reference for the transistor to be able to turn on. But in reality, because that's provided by the little coil that does the transistor directly, uh, I, I think this is actually filtering. I think it's a, just a very simple filter to provide stability. Maybe it helps set the frequency or maybe it just purely is to avoid harmonics or sort of high frequency that could end up resulting in false triggering of transistors or even electrical noise. But I think it's more likely to be for stability of the circuitry. Uh, that is it. The circuitry is not complex. I mean, I say it's not complex when you do a component count on it, but what's happening is complex. And 
Having watched uh, these lamps evolve from the early days, they used to be stupidly complex, but now they're a whole lot simpler. The one thing that's uh, notably different from this versus a really expensive ballast is that normally, before the, these smoothing capacitors, you'd normally just have, say, a filter capacitor, and then you'd have what's called a power factor correction circuit that would uh, try and draw the current over the full sine wave. This one doesn't have that, so I wonder if I wonder what the power factor is for this. Deep down, I wish I had a 40-watt uh, tube here to actually try that. It would have been interesting checking that, but kind of irrelevant because, well, who uses fluorescent tubes these days? But that is it. It's nice that it's done a single-sided board. Um, it's a nice, simple, logical layout. They've included extra component positions, notably uh, a resistor, balancing resistors across each of these capacitors and also discharge resistors, I suppose. But uh, that's something that uh, is to prevent a voltage imbalance if the capacitance values are slightly different or an asymmetrical waveform. Uh, but um, they've not done that here. I guess they thought, well, we just don't need them, so we won't put them in. Um, but that is it. It's neat. It's a, a generic fluorescent driver on how many of these are in use. It looks so mass-produced that I'm pretty sure that many cheap fittings will have them in them. And uh, it's just nicely simple and uh, refined. It's exactly the same circuit, just in a larger size, that you'd find in a... A compact fluorescent lamp. Now, what are these transistors? I did note this down, but I completely forgot what they were. Uh, they are MJE13003. 13003, a MJE, it doesn't actually say MJE, but that's a 13003, which is a very standard uh, transistor. Uh, used in these, it's commonly used in uh, many of these ballasts. But that's it. It's quite interesting. It's super flimsy and lightweight. It's cheap and nasty. But ultimately, when it comes to the crunch, it will do the job. And if you consider the ones in the compact fluorescent lamps that just got baked and just kept going, it's very refined. It's a, it's just a super simple, standardised, reliable design. Actually very neat.